Luke chapter 9, verse 23 through 25. Then he said to the crowd, speaking of Jesus, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. I realized when the worship team was just singing that song that maybe the Lord is orchestrating our steps today. Amen. Jesus went on to say, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. We view the kingdom of God as upside down. But in all reality, we live an upside down life, and we've got accustomed to living upside down, so the principles of the kingdom look upside down, but in all reality, they are right side up. So, so when I give my life to the cause of the kingdom, he really gives me a new life and a saved life. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? Today, I want to take my text from verse 23. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Everybody say, my way. way. We have to give up our way. Everything that we think, everything that has got us to this point, we have to lay it aside and evaluate, does my way align with God's way? And if it does, then keep on doing that. But if it doesn't, we have to go God's way. Why don't you put your Bibles down, let's lift our hands, and let's ask the Lord to minister to us today. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the peace that we feel in this room today, God. Thank you for every person that's in this room, all those watching online, Lord. I'm asking today that you would speak to us. Lord, but you not just speak to us, but you'd speak through us today, Lord. Help us to be your hands and your feet. Lord, and also help us to not just hear your word, but do your word, Lord. We don't want to be guilty of being recipients, Lord, without taking action. Lord, today we remind ourselves that faith without works is dead. Lord, and we put our faith in you, but we also put our works in you. We also put our life in you, Lord, and we thank you for what you're going to do. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, put your hands together and let's thank the Lord as you're seated this morning. Amen. Uh, It's my job to preach what the Bible says. That means I can't speak for other churches and other preachers and other pastors, but I can speak for Conroe Church that we are a Bible-believing church. We are a church, and you've heard me say this a lot the past several months, we are a church dedicated to living life the Bible way. But that means that we are, individually, we are individuals who have made the decision that we are going to live life the Bible way. And when we come together as a body of believers, we are automatically living the Bible way as a church because we have made that individual decision decision. In other words, we don't just read the Bible and agree with the truth therein. We live in submission and obedience to God's Word. Can I get an amen? amen? We put action to our understanding of what the Bible says, because faith without works is that I'm ringing a little bit up here, Brother Sound Man. If you can maybe turn me down just a little bit. Amen. We put action to our understanding. There is no gap. In other words, there, there must not be a gap between what we profess to believe and how we live. Can I get an amen? amen? If we say one thing as believers and do another, we are hypocrites. We are double-minded. And Scripture tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his or her ways. So the only possible way for you and I to close the gap between our way of life and God's plan for our life is to follow the instructions of Jesus in Luke chapter 9 where he says, give up your own way, take up your cross, not sometimes, take up your cross daily and follow after me. I'm here to report to you. If you wanted to hear my testimony today, here is my testimony. I have never regretted dying to my flesh, dying and following Jesus. It's the best decision that I have ever made. So as your pastor, it's not only my responsibility to preach what the Bible says to the seen world. It's also my responsibility to preach to the unseen world. We must push against the spirits of wickedness in this present age. That's why recently I've been 
preaching uh, more boldly than I've ever preached before, not because I'm mad, not because I'm angry, but because I'm preaching to the seen world, I'm preaching to needs that I see and needs that I feel in our local community, but I'm also pushing back against the spirits of darkness in this present age and in this region that are on assignment from hell to, to cause a chaos in your life and confusion in your thought life. So this is why I've been preaching bold, but I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to the spirits that have attacked you. I'm preaching to confusion, I'm preaching to anxiety, I'm preaching to the spirits that desire to stir up evil from their unseen places of temporary authority that the Lord has given them on the earth. So let me remind you as I did back in, I believe it was June 2nd when I preached a message entitled Destroying the High Places. Let me remind you that there are no new demons. While we see new schemes and new methodology and new ways of sinning, uh, this is the same battle that began when God kicked Lucifer out of heaven. There are no new demons. There was no new devil. There was no new sin. Sin is sin, and sin will always be sin. Therefore, as believers, we love sinners, but we hate sin. We love God, but we hate the sin in our life. Therefore, we live a life of repentance. We turn from our wicked ways, and we follow after the ways of Jesus. Let me remind you today of the ancient writings of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians chapter 6. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, no, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. In other words, places that God designed for righteousness, evil has infiltrated. And so we are not as a church and as believers, uh, we are not at war with people, but we are fighting a righteous war on behalf of a holy God. And let me remind you that we serve a holy God and no man shall see the Lord if we don't live a life of holiness. Holiness is not a bad word. Holiness is not restrictive. Holiness is my liberation. Holiness is living the Jesus way. Holiness is living the Bible way. And when I lay my way down and pick up God's way, I get more freedom and peace than I have ever had in all of my days. So today I stand before you again just to promote righteousness and wage war against unrighteousness. And there's a couple of things that I want to tell you before that I'm very uncomfortable today. What you might not know is more times than not, I'm very nervous and uncomfortable when I stand before you, but I've just worked on a halfway decent game face. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Second thing is I stand before you very humbly today, but I also stand before you fully submitted and obedient to the burden that God has placed within me, not just to lead you, but to preach this specific message to you. Because today I'm gonna to preach what some would consider controversial. I don't believe it is, I believe it's biblical. So today I'm gonna to preach to you from this title, Believers and Ballots. Whew, it got tight in the room, didn't it? Everybody just take a deep breath right now. Everybody just take it. Good news is I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to your neighbor today, all right? I, preaching to me today. I'm preaching to all of us today. Um, as a pastor, I preach. I preach to needs that I know, but I also preach to the time and the season. In other words, if you, if you stay awake for 25% of our sermons in January, you know that we're preaching about a fresh start. We're preaching about a new day and new habits and new consecrations and new commitments. And if you stay awake long enough to get to February, you know that we're going to talk about how great is God's love for us. And we're going to talk about marriage and we're going to talk about relationship. And we're going to talk about the bond that we have between humanity and heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you hang around and you get to April and May, you're going to hear us talk a lot about don't back backslide during sermon, uh, uh, summer. Uh, don't backslide when you're on vacation. Live the same way on vacation that you do during the normal part of the year. And every four years here in America, we enter into a wretched, nasty, divisive season we call election season. 
Is anybody ready for election season to be over with? Can you lift a hand or two? Maybe can you grow a third hand at this point and say, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about this. And like you, I am tired of hearing about this, but if the church doesn't talk about righteousness, then there is a void in culture. And wherever there is a void of righteousness, carnality and evil steps in. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Whenever you quit living the ways of Jesus, there is a void in your life. Uh, there is time in your schedule, and something fills the block of time. Something fills uh, the headspace. Something fills the devotion time that was once filled with the ways of Jesus. I mentioned to you a few minutes ago that I'm so thankful that we are a diverse church. We are Americans we, we, are, we, we are living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. There, there are people yet in this room who are not yet Americans, but they are on the pathway to citizenship, and I celebrate that, and I'm grateful for that because America is a land of immigrants. Uh, we are here today because people immigrated to this land. But in this room today, I see African Americans. I see Caribbean Americans, Haitian and Jamaican. I love the diversity that we have right here in Conroe Church. There are Latino Americans, or let me say like this, there are some feisty Latina mamas in the room today. Gloria Dios, can I get a witness? <laughs> Amen. Now, now, there's all different types of Latinos and Latinas, and we can't talk about that because sometimes we might have a subculture war within the culture war of, of, of Latinos, and we do that in good spirit and in good fun. There's Asians America, there, are, there are Asian Americans who call Conroe Church home. I'm so, so very grateful. There are Native Americans. You see, we come from the East Coast. We come from the West Coast, and there's a few of you who have never left the Gulf Coast. <laughs> Can I get an amen? There's a, probably two or three that have never left uh, Harris or Montgomery County. And for this, we say it's the best land in the world. Uh, but there's some good land outside of here. I've been in Los Angeles this week, and it's an incredibly beautiful, incredibly special place uh, that we were able to go. Now, the person that was living in the Airbnb beneath us uh, thought it was their life mission to smoke as much pot as they possibly could. So if you were to make me take a drug test today, I would fail. Have you ever woke up with the munchies from secondhand smoke? We need to have a deliverance service here before too long. Because Pastor Trent, Pastor Kayla might go back to California this Tuesday through Thursday as well. I am proud to be an American. Is anybody proud to be an American? That's a good thing. We are proud to be Americans. This is the only country in the world where people are fighting to get in and not out of. And so this is, this is an incredibly, incredibly beautiful land that I'm so grateful that we get to live in. But today I want to refocus all of our identities. I want to speak right not only to the culture war, but I want to speak to the spirits of culture that are even vying for your attention over these next, these next four to five weeks, or actually four weeks from tomorrow or, or this Tuesday is election day. We are not just Christians. We are not Christians in name only. We are ambassadors of a different kingdom. Can I get an amen? amen? We are ambassadors. We are citizens of a far more perfect kingdom. Yes, I understand that the founders of this union um, desired to form a more perfect union, and it is more perfect than most other places anywhere on the world. However, we are members of even a far more perfect union than these United States. We are ambassadors and citizens of the kingdom of God. And for this, I am the most grateful for that the creator of the universe has called me and you his sons and daughters. And now through the process of adoption, through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters, and we now live in, in, in an eternal kingdom that will never pass away. And I'm grateful that we are a part of that kingdom, for this flesh that we live in is temporary, but this soul that inhabits this flesh is eternal, and we will live forever with Jesus if we never get confused about the fact that we are ambassadors of his kingdom first. 
This is why the labels we place on ourselves are very important. It's important that you recognize this. We are not Republican Christians. We are not Democrat Christians. We are not libertarian Christians. We aren't socialists or Marxist Christians. That in itself is actually an oxymoron because socialism and Marxism has always tried to silence Christianity throughout time. Hear me today. We are not Republican or Democrat or libertarian. We are not any, we are not any label. We are blood-bought Christians, and we are eternal beings living in a temporary world where we are promoting not the values of a temporary earthly sinful system. We are promoting the values of an eternal God who created the world, who instituted government. Government began with God, and it will end with God at the, at the battle of Armageddon. You see, today, when we made the decision to follow Jesus, we decided to give up our own way of life and follow after Jesus and take up our cross and follow after his more perfect way. That's why any label we place before our Christian identity is an idol. Remember that God told Moses when he gave him the Ten Commandments uh, that you must not have any other gods before me. And here lies tension because God made women and God made men. God made tall people, and God made short people. Hello, sweet Pastor Kayla. (laughs) God made African people. God made Jewish people. God made Caribbean people. God uh, uh, God made Asian people. God made European people. God made American people. And though he made us with differences and each of us with our own nuance and complexities. Uh, Scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created human beings in his own image. So it doesn't matter the label that we put on ourselves or the label that society tries to put on us. Uh, We are created in the image of God. It doesn't matter what color our skin is. It doesn't matter what region of the world we come from. What matters is that we are created in the image of God. And so when we give up our own way of life and we follow Jesus, we also give up every other label that society places on us. That's why there's no room for racism in the kingdom of God. Because no matter what our skin color is, we are, we are all born in the image, the perfect image of God. That's why it doesn't matter what gender you were born in. You were born the skin color that God wanted you to be. You were born the gender that God intended for you to be. And when we try to confuse the identity that God gave us, we are placing ourselves on the pedestal of deity and we are, we are worshiping ourselves forsaking the ultimate government that God instituted when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. Hear me today. We celebrate diversity of culture and ethnicity at Conroe Church. I just spoke to you a few minutes ago about that. I have never been more grateful for the diversity that we see here at Conroe Church. Our diversity makes us better. Our diversity makes us stronger. However, We do not buy into the ideology of dividing people upon race, skin color, and gender. The last time I checked, we are all children of God. We have all, when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we all have the royal blood of Jesus flowing through our veins. Hear me today, racism is sin and it will always be sin. There will never be a day when racism is okay. We stand against injustice to any group of people based upon their skin color or any other way that God created them. If Christians can be divided, spirits of evil advance. And this is why I preach regularly to you against racism. Racism is sin. Racism divides. It divides people outside the church. And that evil spirit tries to divide people inside the church. And we are not going to give the enemy an inch here at Conroe Church. We are grateful that we are different. We are grateful that when I look across the sanctuary, I see different colors of skin and different textures of hair and different styles of food and different styles of clothing. I love the diversity that we see here. 
But if we can get distracted and divided, Satan gains a stronger foothold. Hear me today, we fight for each other at Conroe Church. But not only do we fight for each other, the reason why we fight for each other is because we stand for righteousness. We, we do not serve an American God. We serve the eternal, creative God of the universe. Therefore, we do not view humanity as the systems and the governments of this world desire us to view humanity. We have a heavenly perspective of the things and the people that God created. That's why we view ourselves as ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Yes, I am American. Yes, there's nowhere else I would rather live. If many of you have traveled all over the world, and the world is an incredibly beautiful place because God created it. But there are much more beautiful places than America, but there is no more free place to live, no more place like America that we are able to live in the liberty that God designed humanity to live in. That's why it is our mission as believers, as ambassadors, of a, of a heavenly kingdom. It is our mission to invade politics, to invade entertainment, to invade finance with the principles not of this world, but the principles of the king of kings and the kingdom that we represent. We represent Jesus. We represent the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We represent the God whose government shall see no end. So why are you talking to us today, Pastor, about believers and ballots? Because as ambassadors of the kingdom of God, we are to represent our king's values in every area of our life. Remember, because our life is no longer our life, we laid our life down and we picked up our cross and followed Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the powers, or the King James Version says, the gates of Hades, or hell, will not conquer the church. Uh, Jesus was saying this, Peter, I have given you authority to live and operate in a manner that Satan and all of his demons cannot uh, overcome. They can try to attack you, and the only way they overcome you is if you flee from the principles of the kingdom that I'm trying to birth inside of you. And from this authority that Jesus gave Peter, the church was built. That's why in the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter preached, and he said, men and brethren, the, uh, 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 these people are not drunken as you suppose, uh, for it's only the third hour of the day. It's early in the morning. No, these people are filled with new wine. These, uh, these people are filled with everlasting water. There was an eternal kingdom being built uh, into uh, these people, and Conroe Church in 2024 is a continuation of that same power and authority that Jesus Jesus spoke and prophesied that Peter would receive. And we have that same power and authority to cast out demons, to pray the prayer of faith and heal the sick. And we have the power to lay hands on people and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Not because we are Americans, not because we have the freedom to worship in this nation, because there was a kingdom birthed in me that this nation didn't give me, and this nation cannot take away. We have the same authority Jesus gave to Peter. And in the midst of cultural crisis, political unrest, fiscal irresponsibility, we are to infiltrate earthly systems and government with heavenly influence. That's why I preached to you last week uh, the prayer of Jabez, Lord, enlarge my territory. Lord, Lord, give me more influence in this community. Give me more opportunities to promote uh, the principles of an everlasting kingdom in a temporary world. See, I've said this, but let me echo it today. We are not a Republican church. Neither are we a Democrat church. 
Political parties do not dictate what we do and how we vote. And let me say political parties uh, do not dictate how we preach uh, and what we preach. Uh, we preach the word of God if it's legal or if it's illegal. If we're tax exempt or if we aren't ta tax exempt, uh, we stand for biblical principles and promote righteousness in an unrighteous age. You see, the Bible alone dictates every aspect of our existence. If it doesn't, we are double-minded trying to live in two kingdoms. And a double-minded man is unstable in all of his way. Let me say this today. This is not a political message. This is a righteous message. And I'm just young enough as a millennial to know that clickbait titles get your attention. <laughs> Both political parties are imperfect, and every candidate has fallen short of the glory of God. I don't care what party they belong to. There will never be a perfect candidate. That's why increasingly more and more in the day and age in which we live, we not vote for candidates, we vote for principles. But this being said, it is more important to vote as kingdom ambassadors in an earthly government. See, when Christians operate in our God-given authority, hell's agenda does not advance. Hell seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come <laughs> that you may have life, <laughs> and that you may have life more abundantly. That's why the most blessed countries in the world are countries that follow as closely as possible, even in their brokenness and in their sin, the ways and the principles of the Bible. Allow me to explain this plainly if I haven't been plain enough today. Too many believers are more worried about their preferred animal, a donkey or an elephant, all while the real battle is between the serpent and the lamb. I haven't come to preach to one group of people. I've come to preach to everybody today. Whose side are you on? The serpent or the lamb? That's why we are what we tolerate. What we tolerate, what my wife and I tolerate, will rule and have dominion over my children. Today's complacency will be tomorrow's captivity. What are you tolerating in your prayer life? What are you tolerating in your children's school? Well, I don't want to rock the boat. Do you forget that Jesus walked into the temple and didn't say, could y'all quit selling things? Jesus threw a fit. He kicked over tables. He destroyed things and said, my house will not be conducted like this. What that tells me is that as, as ambassadors of God's kingdom, the kingdom that God has instituted here on this earth uh, that is like sneaky undercover agents in the government systems of man, that we are not to tolerate some things in our life and in our family and in our church uh, because we are the people of God, and we live for God, and we die for God. We adopt his ideology, not man's ideology. And this is why Christians should be involved in the political process. Number one, as Americans, we have the right and the freedom and the liberty if you've ever traveled to a country that is not free, you, you would understand the incredible blessing we have as Americans to vote. That's why if you haven't registered to vote, tomorrow, October 7th, is the final day to register to vote. I'm not telling you what party to vote for, who to vote for. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. I believe that you can make grown-up decisions and make a, 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 the, the right decision for you and your family. But I can tell you that as believers, we should infiltrate the systems of this world and promote godly moral principles. 
There are over 30 million professed Christians in this nation who are not even registered to vote. The church cannot gripe about what's happening in culture. The church is the problem. I'll move on and get off my soapbox. <laughs> my fear is that too many Christians have tolerated things that we have the authority to rebuke. We tolerate sin and unrighteousness being promoted where Christianity and kingdom principles are not allowed to be promoted, not because they are illegal, but because unrighteous men control many facets of our local government, our state government, and our national government. We tolerate these things. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that we should be um, problem causers because we are instructed. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacekeepers. But if you think that we can sit idly by and, and claim peace as our excuse to not promote righteousness, I wonder how we will be judged. Because in Genesis, God told, Ad, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and to govern the earth. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I know it's quiet. I know, I know, I know, I know. Hopefully, Pastor Smith is preaching next Sunday. I've, ho hopefully, hopefully, I've been preaching to you long enough. But, but we still have to talk about these things. The world, not America, the world is in the state it's in because righteousness will not stand up and promote righteousness. America's problem is not that the devil has become more evil. He is no more diabolical today than he was the day that God cast him out of heaven. He's no more evil today than he ever was. But we as, as, as Americans, as, as, as Christians in America, the American church faces these two problems. We have become complacent, and we have bought into carnal systems of government rather than infiltrating a carnal government with godly, eternal principles. Whose kingdom do you want to belong to? You're offending me. The Word of God is the most offensive book you will ever read. I'm not trying to offend you. I love you more than I've ever loved you. I'm trying to let you realize that we, trying to help you realize that we are members of a kingdom that will never fail. The king that we serve will never lose a battle. <laughs> He's never lost and he never will. <laughs> And if we stay on his side, we will be victorious. We will trample over sin. Last time I checked, uh, that the hill will bruise the head of the serpent. Uh, last time I checked, uh, Jesus will be victorious against the Antichrist. Uh, last time I checked, uh, angels will defeat demonic forces at the end uh, of time. Last time I checked, uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Is anybody grateful to be a part of the church today? We are a part of a far more perfect government instituted by Jesus. That's why I've told you this before, and I want to, in just the last few minutes I have with you, I want to tell you this. Government begins and ends with God. And I don't want to just make a statement. I want to back it up with Scripture. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that there were six days of creation. On the seventh day, God rested. And that's why the seventh day or for us, the first day of our week, we take one of the seven days of our week and we rest. That's why Sunday is our Sabbath. In the Jewish culture, Saturday is their Sabbath. They don't turn on their phones to, uh, in, in this age. Uh, uh, they don't work. Uh, they don't clean their house. They relax. They spend time with friends and family, and they worship. And we as, we as believers, as Christians, we must get back to the principle of Sabbath. Don't just come to church on Sunday and then run the rest of the day ragged doing errands. I understand that our time is limited, but we must make space to spend with not only our brothers and sisters in Christ, but to spend with our families resting and relaxing, kicking the soccer ball in the backyard, sir, throwing the baseball in the backyard with our family enjoying the blessings that God has given us because why on the seventh day God rested but shortly after creation God blessed Adam and Eve and said be fruitful multiply fill the earth 
and govern the earth. Government began with God, and according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, government will end with God. And after that, Paul said, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom of God, or or he, or he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler, authority, and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Mankind was never intended to die. But when sin crept in, death was our sentence. There's now pain in childbirth. Man must now work to provide. We read about this. uh, we We read about this in the book of Genesis. But there's coming a day for those of us who have rooted our life and applied the blood of Jesus over our life and our families uh, that we are citizens of a different kingdom uh, and we will now long and we will no longer be held captive uh, by the systems uh, of this world uh, that sin has produced. Uh, aren't you thankful that we're going to heaven where sin is not welcome? The writer of Psalms chapter 22, the whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. Not Christians. The whole earth will acknowledge. That means every faith. That means every thought process. That means every every gender, if you will, even though there's only two. Every person who identifies as any gender or any type of lifestyle. Everyone who walks the earth. Every nation will acknowledge the Lord and we will return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him, for royal power belongs to the Lord, and he rules all the nations. He sets up kings. He tears down kingdoms. Why does God allow bad things to happen? I don't understand this. I preached you a a message a few months ago about the secrets belonging to God. There's some things that we will never understand, but what we do know is the more I trust him, the less I desire, uh, the less I desire to understand, and the more I just want to have communion with God. You recognize the understanding and wisdom and knowledge uh, is is the thing that got humanity in the shape it's in. When did sin enter into the garden? When Adam and when Adam and Eve partook of the tree of what? The knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge will get you in trouble if you let it. That's just a side point. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Stand with me today. Stand with me today. We'll talk to you now about the role of the church and culture. Hallelujah. Why don't you just lift your hands and just thank the Lord that you're a part of the church. We're part of a far more perfect, far more perfect kingdom. Hallelujah. Come on, just say that's the highest praise. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your praises to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your kingdom, Lord. Perhaps you're familiar with Paul Revere's famous horseback ride through Lexington, Massachusetts, yelling, the British are coming. What you may not know is the final destination of Revere's ride was to the house of Pastor Jonas Clark. Why Pastor's house? Why? Why, if the British are coming, why? Are we rallying troops, but also going to a pastor's house? Well, because Pastor Jonas Clark was housing two men who you might have heard of, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, two signers of the Declaration of Independence. Let me also say that of the 13 colonies, I believe 11 uh, 11 or 12 out of 13 of them to run for, to, uh, uh, to apply to be governor or to run for governor of those colonies, you had to have a statement of faith and a letter of your pastor's approval. Don't tell me that there's no place in politics for people of righteousness. This country was founded upon creating space for people like you and I to worship freely. The news will not tell you that. 
Modern education will not tell you that. But the fact that we are here today is because men and women died so that we can worship in freedom. The United States of America were not founded to be a place where people that, uh, 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 the, the United States of America were founded to be a place where people could worship God as they chose, not according to how the government told them they had to live. That's why, that's why the settlers came over here. That's why the Quakers came over here. That's why the Puritans came over. Were they perfect? Absolutely not. But they had a way of faith. They had a relationship with Jesus, and they did not want to have to be a part of the church of England. They wanted to worship God as the Bible instructed them. Let me say this. Had pastors not been involved in the protection and promotion of biblical values, there would be no United States of America. Uh, and, and I understand that some of you, this is not how you like to hear me. Trust me, this is not how I like to hear me. <laughs> But if pastors in this country don't stand up and speak the truth in love. Look, I'm willing to die for the cause of Jesus, but that don't mean I want to die for the cause of Jesus. I'm willing to. I'm willing to. But it, it doesn't have to get to that point. If people of God invade the earthly broken systems of this world. I'm not being political. Hear me today. Don't, don't believe that lie. I'm not being political today. America needs pastors who will stand up and tell you to vote against tyranny. And I'm not placing a badge on me today Hear me today because I've got a lot of faults, got a lot of shortcomings. I'm far from perfect. But if there's anything that I am doing right, and I hope I always do right, is I want to be a pastor that leads you the Bible way. Pastors in this nation need to tell you to vote against religious persecution and for the nation of Israel. That's not political. That's Bible. Yes. Pastors need to stand up in this nation and tell you to vote against abortion. Pastors must tell you to stand up Go to the ballot box and vote against sexual perversion and predatory behavior against minors and the mentally ill. If the church doesn't stand up for the marginalized, who will stand up for the marginalized? I don't understand why if a drunk driver gets in a wreck and kills a pregnant mother, he's tried as double homicide. But somehow abortion is not homicide. I don't understand this. I don't understand how both political parties in this country have gone soft on same-sex marriage. Both political parties are soft on abortion. These are not government problems. These are moral problems. These are Bible problems. And the church stands against evil and unrighteousness. And if we don't, we will be judged. Jesus said in Matthew 25, and the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You have to be 21 to buy alcohol. You have to be 18 to buy cigarettes. But you can be 14 and your school assign you gender-affirming care? Do you, we not understand the madness and the sin and the moral depravity that is happening around us? And we have to stand up as the people of God 
not as Republicans, not as Democrats, as blood-bought believers. Does our heart not break for the things that break God's heart? Have we bought into the lies of moral carnal systems to where we have a, con a, a seared conscience? I'm not telling you to vote Democrat, Republican. I'm telling you to vote the Bible way. And if the Bible offends you, you're wrong. And if the Bible offends me, I'm wrong. Concerning the two political parties in this country, let me speak to them because we had both of them in this room this week. The left wants the kingdom of God. In other words, they want justice without the king, without righteousness. Many on the right want, want the king, they want righteousness without the kingdom, without justice. Neither party is the solution to the problems facing this country. Jesus is the answer for the world today. And it's your job and it's my job to represent the king, righteousness, and his kingdom, justice. Not just in this room, not just on your job, not just at the Thanksgiving table, but the first Tuesday in November at the ballot box. Amen. It's our responsibility. You, and the beautiful thing about this nation is you have the freedom not to vote. And nobody's going to be mad at you. I'm not going to be mad at you. We have that freedom. We have that liberty. But do you want to live only according to the freedom of a man-made government, or do you want to live according to the righteous rules of the God who sets up kingdoms, tears down kingdoms? I know you've been standing. Why don't you gather with me around the front? I would love for everyone to gather with me today. I believe that righteousness and justice are about to flow through this altar today. Hallelujah. Can you just say that with me today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't vote against God. Don't vote against God. You'll have to answer for it. Don't vote against God. For Proverbs 21. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. This is how oftentimes bad leaders promote good policy. And sometimes why good leaders promote bad policy. We don't understand these things. We never will. But God puts godly people before ungodly leaders to sway their opinion and decisions. And Conroe Church, the Lord wants to use you. The Lord wants to promote you. The Lord wants to open up his hand of favor on not, on, on not this nation, on your family. And this nation gets blessed because our families are blessed. Hear me today, we must not view ourselves as Democrats and Republicans or independents or whatever other parties there are. We do not view ourselves as that. We see ourselves as Christians Voting the Bible way. Yes. In, in closing, let me just say this. Well, what's God's will? This book is God's will. Every, every uh, ballot casted, every 
amendment voted for, resolution. I don't even know what's all on the ballot this year. There's just so much noise. But let me give you four quick guidelines, and then we're going to pray. Number one, vote for prosperity. Socialist countries dissolve churches that get too big. We, this week, were with missionaries from all over the world who have grown churches to thousands and, and governments of this world today walk in and shut them down. We don't vote for that. We vote for the expansive increase of the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, thy kingdom come. Pray this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Yes. Number two, the second guideline. I should have had this on a screen, but I was less slick today and more burdened. <laughs> Number two, vote for life. The spiritual condition of man is at the root of the abortion issue. And one of the ten laws that are to govern all of, all of the societies of, of the world are this. Thou shall not kill. Number three. Hear me today. I'm trying to have a strong backbone, but yet speak with mercy and peace as well today. Vote for biblical marriage. Amen. There's no other way to say this. Same-sex marriage is offensive and repulsive to God. If you don't believe me, go read what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, not this action, this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved. Hear me today. We are full of compassion. Anyone at any time is welcome in this church. We turn no one away because we believe the power and blood of Jesus is that strong. We don't exist for us four and no more. We exist for whosoever will take up their cross, turn from their sinful ways, Number four, and then I want to share with you a prophecy that was given to me this week. Number four, vote for Israel. Amen. Consider what the Jewish people have given the world. They have given us this book. The prophets, major and minor, all Jewish. And they gave us our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. Born of a virgin, Mary, who was a Jew. So our scripture instructs us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee.